short. So first of all, I mean, all of you, ladies and gentlemen, we, we really appreciate that you are joining us tonight. And we, we say for all of you, good evening and good afternoon to Dr. Paul and the team back in the US. Uh, first of all, uh, I would love to send my apology on behalf of everyone, the team in the US and the team here in Oman for the inconvenience of the last week. We really want to, to share all, all, all the knowledge, but sometimes technical problems, let's say difficulties happen. So we firstly, we apologize for that. And we extend, I mean, our, our thanks to all of you here again to join us. So uh, thank you so much. And welcome to the fifth webinar of this program. So for those who didn't attend it from the beginning, this program, I mean, consists of six webinars until the end of 2021. Um, today is or tonight is the fifth one. Uh, I, I mean, among those six webinars. So I have to say that this program actually derives from the collaboration between the National Museum, the, the leading museum in the country, and the Smithsonian Institution uh, in the US, the world's largest museum uh, and uh, complex uh, research in the US. We're talking about around 21 museums, Dr. Paul, and nine research complex. Correct me if I'm wrong in numbers, so it's a huge place there. And we wish you always uh, all the best. And we, we thank the US Embassy here in Muscat for their constant support and sponsorship this program and multiple program with the National uh, Museum. This program will be focusing on the 21 uh, century museum professionals, specialists and students. Um, and this program is going to elevate the museum's industry and the knowledge of individual and organization. Um, just to remind you that we had four sessions before three of them, the three, first three sessions were presented by Dr. Paul and they were about visitor service, greeting, ticketing and crowd management and the history of representing cultures and museums and cultural centers with uh, an introduction to the Smithsonian. And the third one was virtual exhibition and other museum uses of the web. And as I said, it was, I mean, all presented by Dr. Paul. And the last one, um, we had uh, a case study on money as a material culture, collection and curation at America's Money Museum. And that was done by Dr. I mean, by Mr. Douglas Mann. For tonight, we have, uh, let's say an exciting uh, topic, which is talking about program development, developing dynamic programming and visitor engagement. And of course, will be presented by Dr. Paul. For those also who didn't attend our program or we missed or who missed the first webinars, Dr. Paul, uh, Michael Taylor, he's a research anthropologist at Smithsonian an institution since 1981. And he's the curator for Asia, Europe, and the Middle East in the Smithsonian Anthropology Department. In addition to that, he served as a director of Smithsonian Asian Culture, Cultural History Program, and he received his bachelor degree from the University of California at Los Angeles in 1975 and his PhD from Yale University in 1980, and both of them uh, in anthropology. Also, Dr. Paul uh, is an author and an editor of several books, scholarly articles on the anthropology, uh, ethnobiology, art, and languages. And we're going to share uh, with you a link in the chat box where you can just view and download some of Dr. Paul's papers. Um, also, Dr. Paul curated 24 museums exhibition, and five of them were virtual exhibition. And of course, he received countless grants and awards from different countries uh, in the world. Um, before, uh, to turn off your mics and just be careful to Dr. Paul. He's full of knowledge and it's a promising uh, evening tonight. So uh, wish you all the best, Dr. Paul, and for the rest, enjoy the presentation. Thank you. Well, thanks so much to Mr. Issa Al-Radini for that wonderful uh, introduction. And thanks to 
the Learning Center and all of the National Museum for the hosting of this great uh, series, which we very much appreciate. I hope you can hear me okay. I also join in two things. First, uh, thanking the US Embassy for all its uh, support. Uh, that's been great for everybody. And uh, especially I join in apologizing. I am the one, not the National Museum, who should apologize for our technical difficulties, which we managed to overcome, but uh, only too late to actually start last week uh, the uh, the webinar, and so we believe that's these issues have been resolved in connectivity and so on here. Sometimes, you know, because of the pandemic, everything is closed down for a long time, and when we reopen, we discover as we're resetting things up that there are some gaps. So uh, hopefully, the issue um, has been resolved uh, for into the future. But we uh, apologize for the technical difficulties that caused the delay in this webinar. My topic is program development, developing dynamic programming and visitor engagement. And when we talk about museum programming, we're talking about a very interesting combination of things. And it led me to think about uh, programming and what the word program even means. So um, I am going to uh, now uh, go on to the next slide. Uh, Oh, I'm uh, sorry, I have not yet shared my screen. So I will do that first. Um, let me go back to previous slide, title slide. And um, I think if I'm allowed to share my screen now, here we are. Hopefully you can see my title slide now. And um, that's the topic of today's uh, webinar. Um, and let me move to the next slide. Um, I have the webinars divided into two parts. First on program and exhibition development and how particularly we, when we develop exhibition, we think of the public programming as it's called that goes with the exhibitions. And then also museums as cultural centers, museum activities and programs. And you'll notice that when Mr. Issa Aladini kindly in that's one sense of the word program. It means that a, a, a set of activities, like a department uh, here, bureau is the highest level, then department, then program. And so there's a budget, there's a group of people working together, there's a director of the program and so on. It's a, a, a unit of an organization. But the common use of the word program is also meaning an, an activity that a museum does. So actually, this led me to Mr. look Paul? at- Paul? Yes. Um, oh, I'm afraid to tell you that it's not appearing the, the presentation. It's yeah, not there. Screen, oh, yes. Could you, could, you just, could you just do that sharing screen, please? Oh, so sorry. Really sorry to interrupt you, but I had to- I thought it was. Yes. Let's see here. Here Is we it, go. Now it's sharing. Okay. Let me go back. And, yeah. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. This was my you, final please. slide, and I'm sorry. I actually had it sharing in the test before we started. Um, and now, moving to the, the fact that we have two parts program and exhibition development. Here we are. And also museums as cultural centers. That's what I was saying earlier that in, in talking about the multiple uses of the word program, which leads me to talk about the um, etymology and origin of this word program, which actually comes from the Greek graphine, which has a form gram or gramma, pro meaning before, uh, graphing is the same word in graphic. It means write, it refers to writing. Uh, and so writing before or in front of people. So it came in, in a very early sense of the word uh, to mean a public notice in writing, an edict of some kind, something like that. It's far from the current meaning as you see. But from this, uh, by the 17th century, the public notice in writing came to refer to the written program of 
of musical performances or activities, which would be in a performance, if you had a theatrical performance or a musical performance, and word program in that way. We say if an orchestra is going to perform, then we will ask to get the program, which will list everything that they're going to perform that evening and who's playing and so on. That's, that's just the program. Now, this word uh, uh, program then came to be in a more broad sense, not just a written set of activities, but also just the activities themselves that could be carried out as either performances or film series or um, even uh, uh, research activities. And then from that meaning of the word, which is the normal wording of a museum program. So every exhibition will have certain, what we call public programs accompanying it. Um, and then um, you have yet another meaning, which is the meaning when we say Asian cultural history program that has a director, and that's an office that organizes a coordinated set of activities. We can call this kind of office an integrated curatorial program, that is a curatorial office that organizes these programs. And the programs that it's organizing might be performances that have their own written programs, <laughs> which is yet another use of the word. So um, I have to say English is rather ambiguous in terms of its meanings in this way, but I'll use some examples. And let's look at the range of activities first that museums normally do. I'll use an example from our SIC exhibition, and this is showing here as just one example. I'll use some others. And then we also did an exhibition on Korea, which is, uh, this, this is the catalog for that. And we have some other books and examples that I'll show in a minute. But exhibitions has many parts that we're creating an exhibition. And then we do activities in association with that exhibition. And those are characterized by other components of a museum's activities besides doing exhibitions. We have education. Educational activities includes activities for schools, adult programs they're called. That means programs that non-children, not just school children, but that adults are invited to like lectures, performances and so on, tours, materials. All these things are called educational programs. We also have various kinds of outreach programs, um, and those include lending, traveling exhibits, and so on. So in, our, in the case of our Korean exhibit, I just showed you some of the uh, uh, activities like the um, public activity doing uh, Korean calligraphy for people. And then here is an outreach activity of taking our exhibit that we opened and showed here in uh, 2003 in January, and by June, it was already um, being shown uh, elsewhere around the country and it traveled around the country. Another museum activity, of course, is research. And I've talked about this before, so I'm not going to be focusing on that so much this time, but that includes publication of source materials and research result, re results. And a case that I'd have talked about before was our online preparation of the uh, big publication about the 1926 expedition to New Guinea shown here. But even that had some public programs associated with it because when we launched it, we did a big event. Since it was a Dutch and American expedition, we did the event in the Netherlands. Um, it was a big reception, it was a conference, and so these are the kinds of public programs that also can accompany, accompany research projects, not just exhibition projects. The other area of museum activities that often has uh, programs associated with is collections. Now these are behind the scenes areas of work for museums in many cases, so collection management, conservation, getting people access to the collections, how they use collections, deaccessioning, storage, handling, borrowing. These are matters that are often kind of hidden. And it's a little bit hard to really get a lot of funding or financial support 
for these kinds of hidden behind the scenes collections activities that they're very central to our museum. But one of the overall themes that I want to emphasize today is that when we are developing our public programs, since we know that these behind the scenes act activities are quite essential to museums, we want to be developing the public programs that support them. So when we're doing exhibits, when we're doing highly visible things like performances, we try to make sure to kind of bring to the public some of these behind the scenes activities that people don't really see. And the, these activities that we're doing are called our uh, educational outreach or other museum uh, programs. The exhibition called Six Legacy of the Punjab. This is the view of the opening of the exhibition when it first opened in 2004 here at the Smithsonian at our museum. And this is the, one of the entrances to the exhibition. There were, there were two entrances. Um, and, you know, uh, there are a lot of steps in doing an exhibition like this, but now what I am really focusing on is the fact that from the beginning, when we were planning, we were also looking at ideas for public programs that um, could accompany the exhibition before it opened and also when, when it opened. I say before it opened is also important because the exhibition opened in 2004, but we began a new project called the Sikh Heritage Project in the year 2000. Just raise funding for an exhibition or for any other big thing and expect to just wait until we have the full funding before we do anything. We need to build up a kind of level of public support and awareness of the project first. And then we can do the exhibition at the level that we can uh, manage after that period of time when we're developing the project. So we sort of started small, thinking about doing a small vitrine or something like that. And then uh, also some public programs, which are much easier to do than big exhibits because you just plan to, to do something interesting in an auditorium. We developed lectures, film showings. We had events around the country, uh, but really we knew that in the long run, what we were doing is to plan some big method by which Sikh heritage, the heritage of the Sikh people of Punjab, of India and Pakistan uh, could be represented in our uh, exhibition. So we had uh, a kind of historical overview of Sikhism. We knew that that would be important, but we had to have a lot of events first around the country with gatherings of Sikh population to decide what was the important thing um, that the people themselves wanted to say about their own culture. Um, I'll mention that in this section of the exhibition, we're talking about Maharaja Ranjit Singh. So it would have been the very early 19th century first Maharaja ruler of the Sikh empire. Uh, you see, and, and I think you can see my cursor now on the screen. Uh, I should be careful about using it too often, but here, this is his image. But these are ivories that from a large series of ivory that um, show the people in his court. And one of them shows him as well. Um, we had to rotate them. We couldn't have them all at once because ivory is very fragile and the paint would fade if we kept it in the light. But here's the one um, about him. And here is an, another member of the court. If you look, at these ivories, there's an interesting story going on at them, in them. So we knew that this is an example of hidden sort of collection management, boring stuff that people don't see in the exhibition. And we wanted to make sure that we got some public programs about that as well. You see, these ivories were placed on velvet and they were 
glued on with an adhesive, which was slowly working its way through and would eventually very much damage the ivory from the back. So we had to clear out the adhesive from the backs and do some conservation work. And on many of the objects, we did conservation work. So when the exhibition opened, one of our public programs was to organize the conservator who worked on this to go into the gallery with her demonstration photographs and so on and talk to groups of people about the procedures that she used for doing conservation work on the objects. This kind of tour, lecture tour of a specialized kind is an example of the public programs that accompany even the most sort of hidden uh, behind the scenes aspects of museum work like conservation and uh, collection management. Even as we're planning to bring the exhibition together, we try to get publicity and build up enthusiasm through these examples of public programs. So we did a series of events, lectures about different aspects of uh, cultural heritage of the six, which could be later shown in the exhibition. And that built up enthusiasm in the large Sikh American uh, population, particularly. Um, one of the things that came out of our community meetings was the importance of the Golden Temple, so-called, or Darbar Sahib in Amritsar, and its architecture and its, its, its sort of sacred position for the Sikh people. And so we decided to have as a centerpiece of the exhibition, a model of this exhibition, um, made by the same person who did the model, which is now in train station in Amritsar. Um, and it's a beautiful thing with gold and so on. And it's been traveling with the exhibition. Now, during the pandemic, the exhibition itself is in storage. We hope to start traveling it again, but this is still being used. We let a, a Sikh organization continue to display it um, during this period. Rather than just wait until it shows up, we tried to get publicity and activities at every step of the way. There's the artist at his studio in India, for example. And then, and, and then when we unpacked it here, we, uh, we uh, also did some more, uh, some more display of it and, and activities to kind of get publicity. So we organized events to see him putting it together and then before he actually shipped it to the United States. So we got a lot of publicity in India. So something that doesn't have to have a lot of publicity or you know, big events, just order you know, a, a model to be made. And yet even those kinds of things can be turned into program development that help you build your audience. And really this is our purpose and function in having these kinds of programs besides the educational value you're building up the audience for the message that you're trying to convey and for the um, uh, activities the uh, events the exhibition the research project whatever it is that is a, a key part of your current effort in your museum now this is now talking about the development of public programs to accompany exhibits. What we haven't been discussing here, but for another, another time, is how you pick those uh, projects in the first place. Why pick this exhibit as opposed to others? And then you have to balance this with other exhibits of a different kind and so on. But the point is, if you've got a project, whether it's a research project or an exhibit or anything else, how can you supplement this by developing public programs to accompany the big activity that you're trying to do. Here's just even unpacking it, we can turn into a, an opportunity to have a little sort of mini event about uh, packing and shipping of art objects. So just really uh, eventually what we have is not just the packed object, but the thing itself on, on display at a successful event with the opening of the exhibition. If we had just waited for that, then this would be maybe part of the publicity and the activity for the opening event. But by the time this opening event occurs, you see 
we've had a numerous public programs about the various steps, the conservation work, the, um, the, the, the community discussions about how Sikhs should be represented, the uh, creation of the model that will be used in the exhibit, the formation of different people's private collections that we borrowed from, all of these things were activities that around which we could develop programming. Now, for the opening event itself, this is where people really uh, always talk about the program development in museums. Um, that is, you don't just one day, you know, go into the museum and the, mu and the exhibit's not open yet, and the next day you go in and the exhibit is open and nothing happens. I mean, that can happen and does happen, but usually, this is precisely the occasion on which um, these kinds of events that are anthropologically what we can call rituals take place. And that's like the opening of an exhibition. Here's the opening of the exhibition, Six Legacy of the Punjab in July of 2004. Uh, there's actually Amritsar and its golden temple in the backdrop of the performance that was taking place. We had you know, high level, speakers from India and Pakistan. And but I may I may add that it, it's not always easy to get high level government officials from both of those countries to celebrate in the same event in Washington. But, it, but for this, they did so. And, um, and here is the performers who are from a world music group based in Australia who came to perform and they're mixing traditional musical instruments from the Punjab with as you see on the left, the Australian didgeridoo, an indigenous Australian musical instrument. The idea being to indicate that this cultural tradition has now become global, um, a wonderful series of activities at the opening, uh, but also at every subsequent venue. This is the reception you know, upstairs from the auditorium where the opening event was first held. And so people are celebrating with uh, Punjabi food and lots of discussions. We had that same day and, um, and uh, in, in, in subsequent days, a series of activities, including uh, lectures. These are two artists who are twins, whose art was in the exhibition, talking about the inspiration of their work. We also had film series. Um, and I, this, I have to say, was uh, one of my ideas. <laughs> because people had to get from the auditorium up to the reception. So I thought, let's have somebody show the way. And I don't wanna just be showing the way myself. So we organized these dull drummers to come to the front of the auditorium. And we asked that the people in the, beyond the few, first few seats uh, wait and come, let the first rows come out and then second, third and so on. But the drummers would lead the way because we had you know, members of Congress high government officials and so on at the, at the front. So we, we had them lead everybody and then people come out afterwards. And this is wonderful music leading people upstairs. So these are all examples of things that are not really part of the exhibit per se, but what we call the public programming. Um, and so uh, that's what goes on. Now at every subsequent venue, and I don't have time to show you all of them and throughout its, its travels in, in, in different places in California and Texas and so on, we had other public programming to accompany the same exhibit, but it was unique in each space. I'll just show one example. This is in when the exhibition went to Texas, San Antonio, Texas. And you'll see it's a rather different look to the place. It's got big photographs uh, just outside the exhibition in the hallway uh, showing images of sick temples and, and music and so on that's taking place in Texas. And because the Sikhs wear this turban in their particular fashion, they organized a couple of things, including a turban tying lessons. So members of the general public could take turns coming up and learning how to wear a turban. And then they take a picture of themselves in a turban. So what that's, this is basically doing is something that looks kind of exotic and you know they don't, it's something that Americans don't understand at all. They suddenly realize this is actually um, something that our friends and neighbors are doing and that they could easily understand and, and, and it looks kind of nice. And, uh, 
a very uh, different um, uh, sort of population group and uh, cultural tradition. And, uh, and this was a big success. And I think it was considered a big success by everybody uh, involved. And I don't think it would have had the same level of public interest and attention without all the public programming that accompanied that exhibition. And the exhibition went on, or I should say the Sikh Heritage Project, as we call it, went on to produce several other publications, including the one that recently came out, edited by Sonia Dami and myself, Sikh Art uh, from the Kapani Collection. And we have another one uh, coming out soon in 2022. So it's been an active project and public programming has always been a big part of it. It's been tough to do public programming during the pandemic because you know a lot of interprison activities can be postponed, but uh, that has been a big effort. Now, another project and another exhibition is our Korean Heritage Project. And this was founded in 1985. We've never tried to um, build an empire with it or anything. <laughs> you know, it's always been a, a, a modest effort, a small a, one effort of many, but uh, but an important effort. Uh, I say many, but we can never do very many places at once. I mean, because it's just a, a one single research program and, and, and museum program here, the Asian Cultural History Program. Um, but I, I use this as another example besides the SIC project to illustrate the range of variation. So as usually happens, we set up a dedicated fund and by the terms of the wording of the fund, the money can only be used for a particular type of thing. So this is the wording of how a fund was set up. Um, our auditors would make sure that nobody could use the money. If somebody donated money to this effort, uh, the auditors would make sure that the money only got used for, for this purpose and for no other. Um, so we have a fund set up and then that fund can, do different types of activities. And some of these include the lectures, performances, and events, which I have to say are often much more convenient to put together in a relatively short period of time and very effective in, public, uh, in the public's view compared to collections-based research and publications. Uh, now, publications, uh, this is uh, publications by Chung Su Cho Houchins, my late colleague, who wrote a book about one of our big collections here, but it took many, many years to produce. So these are big efforts to do. And the publications are wonderful to have. This is some of the range of topics in the collections that we talked about. Uh, what I want to say about this, though, is if you, they take years. So if you just do those behind the scenes efforts that come out once every four or five years or six years, then it's going to be hard to maintain a lot of public interest. We've also done exhibits and we've had, we've had a big Korea gallery exhibit I'll talk about in a moment. But again, if you only do a gigantic thing once every six or seven years, it's very hard to uh, maintain that public interest. And that's why we separate those by smaller projects and smaller public programs that are relatively simpler to do, but that maintain the level of public interest. So for example, we did a very small exhibition just of contemporary ceramics. And uh, this was, uh, I think, quite a, a successful um, event. Um, and in the case for the, for the Korean uh, project, um, <clears throat> We also have uh, done a photographic exhibition, which is just using copy prints designed to size. And they're placed in such a way that we can easily travel them. This is a method that I think is extremely effective. And we should consider doing more of these, potentially also in our joint projects with the National Museum. <clears throat> Of course, I'm not saying we should not do gigantic projects, big exhibits, big publications. I'm saying that these are relatively much smaller sized things that are easier to put together in a much shorter period of time. <clears throat> in addition, I would say that we have a nice method of producing this kind of thing on a particular topic 
you, 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 you find somewhere around 45 to 60 slides. <clears throat> With American audiences, if it's more than that, you have a couple of problems. Uh, people start getting confused or losing interest for one thing. But the main thing is that if you want to travel it, there's a certain like length of wall space, which is very common and commonly available in the United States in hallways and university galleries and lots of little places. Of course, here we have huge space because we can do a huge exhibit, but then once you do it, you can't travel it anywhere because very few places have smaller spaces. So if you just get, as in this case, you know, about 55 photographs and they have a theme with about five sections that works perfectly to travel in lots and lots of spaces. So this small photo exhibit could travel easily in a large, uh, again and again, to many places. Um, the other thing, there are lots of tricks, which since this is a professional museum audience, <laughs> I don't mind giving away some secrets. <laughs> it's not really secrets, but you know, almost always if you try to travel exhibits then people get it wrong and you've got 50, 50, even it's just 50 frames. And then if you have a separate label, people will sometimes get mixed up and put the wrong label with the frame. What we did is we, first we get, instead of using glass, we use plexiglass. So it's a little more expensive, but it travels easily and it, it doesn't break as easily. And then for the labels that we did, instead of having a separate label that you put underneath the photograph, we had the matting around the photograph and we silk screen in reverse on the back of the plexiglass so that it's, it's silk screen in reverse so that when people look at the image, they see and read, but it's on the back of the plexiglass. No way can anybody put the wrong label with the, with the photograph because they're all built in to the frame itself. The frame after copy print of the photograph. Also, you don't have to worry about the high insurance costs and, you know, it's a copy print. So everything can be designed to size. It's a very, very convenient way. Um, and uh, here you see um, this picture of the ambassador at that time from Korea. And this is what they look like, you know, and the, 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 the text is here, is in the, in the frame. Now, um, here we are talking about a much bigger project, which is the Korea Gallery, which was a long-term so-called permanent exhibition. Permanent for us is about 10 years. That's what this was. And, you know, we can think about doing uh, bigger projects like this when we have the collections to match. Certainly the Royal Gifts from Oman, for example, is a very, very key collection. Um, but you have to find collection objects that will allow, allow you to put them on display for long periods of time. Most textiles would not be possible, for example, because they can only be shown for a short while, except for some exceptional situations I'll talk about in a second. Um, but the first thing, if we're doing an exhibition about the culture of another country or place is to make sure that we have a good partnership with the one of the prominent organizations, cultural or national organizations in the country. That happened when we signed a memorandum of understanding. Uh, this was in Seoul with the National Folk Museum of Korea. So there I was with the director of the National Folk Museum and uh, our delegations and so on. That was a very nice uh, event, but it was more than just a party and a dinner. It was really a plan to work together with a lot of hard work in the coming year or two to put together uh, a, a joint uh, exhibition about uh, Korea here in the United States. Essential to that plan was that every one of these exhibitions had to have uh, events with them and activities because otherwise, if you just open an exhibition and then 10 years later, you open another one, you're going to lose your audience. You need to have a dedicated group of people who are interested in the subject matter. And uh, that relates again to the question of why we pick particular topics to be working on. So again, I'll mention that I'm not today talking very much about that question, why we picked these topics, 
But whatever topic you pick in your own museum as the thing that you're going to be doing for your projects, for your, for your exhibitions, it's a very good idea to think about public programming uh, that should be developed to accompany that. So here, uh, back to our 2003 photo exhibition, which was a relatively simple matter, uh, 50 or 55 photos, you know, I was just using copy prints, not the original photographs from the 19th century or early 20th century, and also just plexiglass and frames with labels so screened on the back, very easy to travel. Still, it wasn't enough to just have an opening event. We organized a whole bunch of uh, activities. Uh, here, uh, this was the, the winds of Korea. This was actually, I, I actually checked. I do believe this is the fact that I organized the first fashion show at the Smithsonian, if you can imagine such a thing. Uh, because you see, we had all these images uh, and also a collection of historic Joseon dynasty textiles and costumes in our collection. Fashion show of any kind. It was a fashion show about the 19th century Joseon dynasty garments and how they're modified and transformed into traditional fashion. So this was the fashion show uh, in 2003. And it actually had a, a lot of people, even these, a lot of scientists who were here, especially the ladies who are <laughs> were quite interested in coming to our auditorium to see a fashion show, which was a big success. And actually my own family uh, didn't stop joking about this for several months because they said, you know, can you imagine that you were in a fashion show and I was not in a fashion show. In fact, I made it clear when I uh, opened the fashion show with my remarks on the podium that I was just there to welcome everybody to the Smithsonian. I was not one of the people in the fashion show myself, but anyway, here we were. It was a great event, but it's an example of a public program. Um, we also had the performances like uh, this uh, wonderful musical performance. The music and the fashion show and other things, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be as, the, as was the example in our SICK exhibition of, of a conservator talking about the specific kind of conservation she did on the objects in the exhibition. It doesn't, it's not that every part of the musical performance that you show in the performance has to be related to something in your exhibition. It's enough to say that the exhibition is about the cultural heritage of Korea. So we're going to have musical shows about uh, Korean traditional music. That is more than enough. And there is also a connection to the fact that um, we have 19th century Korean musical instruments in our collection, which were being published in our books about the collection. So again, we have the opportunity at the music performance to show some images in our introductory remarks of people, things in our collection and the publications that we're working on. So again, we're bringing out to people the um, hidden collection management type of work. Um, Dreams of a Picture Bride, it's a theatrical performance about the tradition in the 19th century of the earliest, well, actually it's uh, early 20th century, it's, uh, 1903, it was the first organized Korean immigration to the United States. Mostly men to work on um, farms like sugar cane fields and so on. Um, and uh, so they had a, a tradition, a practice of sort of ordering back to Korea to find their brides from their families, they would send the picture of the person that they could marry. And then they would, then the bride would arrive and they would be waiting on the, on the shore for the boat and the boat comes up, then they would identify which one is the one in the picture, which is the one that their family arranged for them. This is a, this was a historic fact about some of the early immigrants from Korea. And so contemporary, playwrights tried to imagine a very interesting series of um, what's going on in their minds, their discussions and activities and the, and the creation of families uh, from that period. And that was the theatrical performance. But um, throughout subsequent years, before the Korea Gallery opened, we had regular performances and including one for the 20th anniversary of the Asian Cultural History Program, which we date this our program in this other sense of being part of our department from the second 
project fund and project that we set up. The first one was just a project. After we had a second one, that was Thailand. After we had the second one in Korea, we considered how are we adding these? We're adding these in a in a History program. Anything that's not on that topic will not be part of this program, even though we might do it because I'm curated for Europe and Middle East as well. But we are going to have a, a coordinated set of different projects. And I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, so this is a music performance at Strathmore. It's much bigger than an auditorium than we could get here. Um, here we are, every Korean, uh, January 13th, which is the date of the first arrival of Korean immigrants uh, in 2000, in, in 1903 has been named by Congress as Korean American Day. So we started having more, well, more fashion shows <laughs> and uh, more activities. And here we have <clears throat> something I showed uh, briefly earlier, um, an event which is the Arts and Crafts Festival. Um, and this is a Korean calligrapher whose work was uh, shown in our exhibition, in fact. And he is teaching kids how to do little bits of calligraphy. And he, in each of them leaves with his or her name written on a piece of paper in, 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 a, in Korean script, you see? So this is just showing how the Korean alphabet works and, how, and sort of basic stuff like this to make Korean, make kids interested in the kind of activity. It's, it's, in other words, it's, it's, it's not hard to imagine activities like this that draw kids in and make, make kids interested in other cultures. And that's the goal here in the United States. It can be the goal in any other country. So that's what our sort of culture days are like. And, and that's what other activities you see there is writing the name of a person uh, yeah, in English and then in Korean and then gives it to the child. Um, here's more people at the craft festival. They're doing uh, painting, they're doing uh, uh, the textiles and so on. So when the Korea gallery actually opened then, uh, and the other thing I want to mention about before about, about our preparations for the gallery is that we actually uh, did some testing of audiences beforehand, not only for the things that could go in the exhibition, but also what kinds of things would you like to see in the way of public programs. So that was very successful in having the audience figure out. We, we asked them, what do you know about Korea? What would you like to know? Would you be more interested in this or that? And we had little pictures to show. I'm gonna go very much more quickly now because this is where the Korea Gallery is located. But basically as a result of, of all of these efforts to build an audience for a Korea Gallery, we able to put those in our proposals and find the funding that turned a sort of storage area part of the museum slowly but surely into a beautiful gallery. Um, so basically this was all uh, privately funded. Here's, here I, I was at the opening of the event with the press and lots of people. So um, we consider this a flagship exhibition. That is, it's like the flagship of a fleet. And in fact, that became the title of the catalog, flagship of a fleet, a career gallery guide. Because what we wanted to emphasize is that just as a flagship, is maybe not the biggest ship in a fleet, but it's the one that goes forward and shows the flag, shows what country it's from, what, 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 what they represent. Similarly, the exhibition represents a lot of other things in a fleet of activities, collection management, you know, conservation, research, uh, building up new collections, outreach, education. There's lots of other things besides the exhibition in that fleet that the exhibition becomes a flagship for. Okay, I think, um, I don't have time to use a similar example in Indonesia, but I just want to say that we did a lot of, when we did our big Indonesian exhibition, we also did films. We did an exhibition at the libraries. Um, we traveled it to other cities around the United States and it traveled to venues on four continents and you know, throughout the United States, in Leiden and in the Netherlands, also to in Australia. And similarly with each of the other exhibitions that we have done, we have tried to come up with good public programs to accompany this. This is our Philippine photo exhibitions and we had wonderful Philippine food, cuisine uh, activities and so on. But I don't really have the time to go through all of these. I just want to conclude 
going through some examples of museum activities and programs that make museums into real cultural centers. And that's where I'm coming to this other sense of the word program, which is that the, our, our, a program as part of a department. And the department is anthropology in our case, but program actually often connects with numerous other departments and even museums and international organizations around the world. So um, the uh, Asian cultural history program uh, is a, an integrated sort of program in this sense, unit, a unit of an organization. And that's an activity that's, that's the uh, locus of activities that's within a particular department. And it finances its activities through a number of grants and various project specific gift funds. And it also has many uh, international programs. So if you look at the organization of the Smithsonian, it's within one of the museums in the one department in one place. Within our program, then we have various types of projects in different regions or countries or with cultural traditions. And I will illustrate just a few examples with Heritage of Thailand, where we did publication and developed our uh, exhibition about royal gifts. This online exhibition has now moved to a new site that is located in Thailand at the Siam Society under royal patronage, which took on the effort of upgrading it quite a bit. So it's a beautiful new site. We had, even in the earliest days of developing this Thailand project, we had visiting lectures. This was one of the uh, princes, uh, his, his Serene Highness Prince Bisatej Rajani came and delivered a lecture about his projects on reducing opium production in the in northern Thailand. A wonderful project and wonderful exhibition, uh, and a wonderful, uh, sorry, a wonderful uh, project and lecture. And from this later developed the opium museum and exhibitions about their efforts at substitution crops and so on. Now, what I want to point out is that here is here are two of our Sikh supporters meeting His Highness the Prince of, from Thailand. So we have people from our various different projects are interacting and, 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 and working together. Um, we have a, an active project with Taiwan. Here's uh, the uh, representative from Taiwan talking with our uh, founding group, um, a, a local collector who shows his uh, collection of deity figures from Taiwan. Um, we did a couple of publications. We've had other public programs include this person who is a wonderful paper sculptor. He makes paper sculptures. So we had lots of school people, school children, as well as adults coming to the rotunda of the museum uh, to see these paper sculpture making demonstrations. And he would give people little examples of his paper sculptures. There's a dance group that is local, but dressed in Taiwanese Aboriginal dance and one of the performances. All these kinds of things are relatively simple things to do that build up enthusiasm in the, in the Taiwanese population, Taiwanese American population here. There's a strong, large population that identifies strongly with Taiwan. Now that builds up the audiences for our museum. So these are relatively simple things to do, invite a paper sculptor to come you know, show a display for a day, but some things take years. The deity figures that were shown in an event became the subject of a publication. We carefully photographed them all, worked with the collection order to identify them. Here uh, is the book that resulted. It took several years of hard work and luck looking through literature. I wrote the introduction to the book, but we also, as a program, just helped the collector put this together. Gods of Taiwan, a collector's account. And I wrote the introduction for this. It's, it's, a, it's really an excellent source of information on an area of cultural history and material culture that is relatively little known. So these are the kinds of source materials and so on that we like to publish. This is our hidden Taiwanese collection. So we have these behind the scenes efforts that nobody knows about going on to improve the collections. It's hard to make them the subject of really a lot of public excitement, but when we have exciting public programs, which we do, you know, um, 
tea tasting events from different types of Taiwanese tea. And so then we take the opportunity to talk about this. And we've had some great events, including one at the craft show, the annual craft show of the Smithsonian. However, I'll not have time to, to, to show all of those. I do want to conclude with two uh, kinds of examples, one relating to Turkmenistan and the other to Kazakhstan, uh, where in both countries where we've worked a lot, it, precisely because we are discussing the idea of doing something similar um, uh, in the future. Uh, that is, we did the American Culture Days in Turkmenistan, and we also did Turkmenistan Culture Days here in the United States. And at the Turkmenistan Culture Days, uh, as you see, the first one in 2011, uh, we put together a book, which I was the first author for, uh, but also our whole team did that. And this is some examples of it. And we also had some wonderful music performances. We had a um, series of, at the Library of Congress, we had not only these music performances, but also a seminar or international symposium that took place. Um, and that was in 2011. Um, then in uh, uh, 2012, we went to Turkmenistan and did American Culture Days there. And then in 2013, we again did Turkmenistan Culture Days. I mean, basically we, we had learned a lot about how to do Culture Days overseas. And so we did a much bigger book, much bigger performances, many more activities. And in several cities around the United States. The, the I, sh, I should say the book was called, and the exhibition that we did was called um, uh, Turkmenistan Arts from the Land of Maktum Guli. Maktum Guli is the sort of national uh, poet, uh, the Sufi uh, poet uh, from Turkmenistan. And so I also was able to luckily uh, find some additional support from Chevron, who's credited in the book uh, here for the publication of um, a trans set of translations of Maktoum Guli's poetry. And I was very honored that uh, the president of Turkmenistan wrote the introduction to that book. Now, in the case of Kazakhstan, we also have done some big performances here and events there. So I want to mention that one of the things that is very possible to do that's much more uh, restricted in its scope and its costs and so on um, is online exhibitions rather than big massive efforts like we did with Turkmenistan bringing so many things from Turkmenistan here. Um, in 2019, which is a better year to use instead of 2020, 2020 was really pandemic year. We had 22 million visitors in person, but we had 154 million online visitors. So uh, the uh, online exhibitions like this one, Discover Kazakhstan. We did this, actually we launched this when the president of Kazakhstan was going to visit Washington in 2010. Uh, and what I would like to mention about this example is a couple of things. One is that the idea for doing this came out of an international museum training seminar in Kazakhstan, where we had a kind of round table discussion afterwards, where we talked about how to look for projects and how to pick projects that we could work on. And we used the example of the 1926 expedition website. And someone mentioned, well, we could do one about our, one of our scientific exhibitions in, in Kazakhstan. And then we started looking into those and thought that one of the best ones to do would be the Kazakh ethnographer, Valkanov. Balikhanov was almost completely unknown in the United States. So we think we've helped change that a little bit because he was really a very interesting and ahead of his time ethnologist who did scientific exhibitions. So we, we did, uh, we launched during the president's visit this website and on the occasion had some wonderful events. So these were at the um, courtyard of the National Portrait Gallery and National Museum of American Art, designed by the same architect, Foster, who worked on, a lot in Astana. You see the great number of events that are there from Kazakhstan. And we actually even published a little booklet, Washington Kazakhstan 2010 Festival, 
um, with a congratulatory message from the ambassador and so on, uh, information. And then the different kinds of Kazakhstan festivals and performances and events that would be taking place that month in celebration of the festival. And so this was one of our early big events. And that was one of the greatest sort of opening events, even though it was not for a gigantic exhibition, it was for a website. <laughs> but it was during the visit of a president of, big, of, a, of another country. So it, 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 of course, grew in size and importance for that reason. In 2019, my final example, we organized uh, an event as part of the annual Smithsonian Craft Show. And this is always held every year, at least until the pandemic happened, at the National Building Museum. It's a very big, biggest annual, biggest juried craft show in the United States. So craft, crafts people uh, who make crafts from all over the United States and Canada uh, come and show their wares here. Also, there's a lot of connection to the people who buy and sell crafts, marketing, and so on. Um, and this was this is very appealing. We did this, as I mentioned, with Taiwan and other countries. And in 2019, we did this with Kazakhstan. So that brings uh, to the Kazakhstani um, crafters who came to this organized display that we put together an opportunity to be here at the same time as all these other crafts experts and marketers are here. So it's a great introduction to the internationalization of Kazakh crafts. During this time, we organized a, an international symposium on Kazakhstan's crafts and, and creative economy. This allowed for our, co our colleagues at the Kasteyev Museum, the counterpart museum, the National Museum of Fine Arts there in, in Kazakhstan, to work with us and have their seminars on crafts. And this is the director of the uh, museum, Dr. Shalabayeva, giving her talk about precisely the kinds of textiles, which were also brought and put on display by the crafters. Um, and here are some of the many other people. I don't have time to show and talk about these in detail, but we had a set of displays that was very popular and you know, lots of people came. And while they were here for their displays, they were with crafters and craft marketers who were a wonderful opportunity for them. And on, on the sidelines of this, before and after the big display at the Smithsonian, they also had organized some other events at the World Bank and some other um, uh, places. Uh, which gave them other opportunities to show the, and 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 there also to sell their their crafts. Um, as part of the lecture afterwards, I did a series that was filmed, and you can still see it online on our National Museum's playlist. Where we were interviewing uh, the artists, so we'd have uh, myself on the left and the uh, interpreter on the right interviewing. In this case, a felt-making artist who was the head of the um, Union of Artisans of Kazakhstan and, and uh, many, several other artists came up. Uh, here are the speakers. We had uh, basically five speakers from the Kastayev Museum and five Smithsonian speakers talking about this subject. So a very good dialogue. Um, before and after we had other events, as I mentioned, this is actually at the embassy of Kazakhstan. Some people who were involved in a fashion show that was done there. And here's the ambassador speaking at the embassy, uh, welcoming the delegation of crafters and scholars who came from Kazakhstan. Uh, here's the little fashion show inside the embassy on Facebook. Um, and here's uh, one of the events right at the uh, National Building Museum where our uh, uh, craft show event was held in 2019. Uh, these are some of the people who participated in the craft show, but and during uh, the other parts of the multi-day display, some people would walk around with little signs saying, ask me what I'm wearing, <laughs> because then they could explain something about the textile and costume traditions and encourage people to see the Kazakh displays. Wonderful event um, and uh, very memorable to everybody who was there. And I, I, I hope that, uh, 
the uh, idea that is actually currently under, under discussion. So let's just say it's under discussion anyway, uh, of having Oman and Oman's own crafts representing, represented at a future um, annual craft show of the Smithsonian uh, might take place. And uh, if so, it would be wonderful to organize some kind of lecture uh, or seminar or symposium uh, with real experts uh, from the museums and perhaps National Museum uh, of, of Oman uh, to be here as well and really sharing with the American uh, people some of the wonderful craft traditions of Oman. Uh, we think that was successful when it was done in the past and we would love to work on this type of project uh, in Oman as well. I wanna thank the whole Smithsonian team. And first and foremost, of course, as I mentioned when I began, I want to thank the National Museum for giving me this opportunity uh, today and, uh, and thank Mr. Issa for your introduction, thank the Learning Center. And of course, thanks again to the US Embassy for its much appreciated support of this partnership. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Paul, uh, uh, on delivering another say, masterpiece uh, presentation to all of us. So huge appreciation to all of you back there. I mean, the whole team uh, uh, in the US. So for our audience, if you have any question, uh, any comments, so please, you are more than welcome to share uh, all your thoughts and your opinions also. Please turn on your mics and do that. If you want to write something in the chat box, also do it and we can just deliver to Dr. Paul and the team. I think maybe we should get some screenshots also. Yeah. Perhaps I already okay. answered everybody's question. I'm <laughs> just joking. <laughs> Maybe, yeah, you, you did it very well, Dr. Paul, so no. Anybody has a question? If you have a question, please do that. All right, I mean, seems to me that you covered everything, Dr. Paul, so. Looks like it, yes, I think I have, I, I already figured out what yeah, I and answered it. <laughs> also, we have, I mean, you know, record the, the session so we can also share it with, with those people who want to, you know, to rewatch the, the webinar or the session itself. So, I don't know if we're coming to an end, for, for this evening. So I'll call it for the last time, maybe. Someone didn't hear it. I mean, clearly anybody has a question or anyone have a question here for Dr. Paul and the team? If not, I just uh, look forward to the next uh, uh, webinar, which is coming up. Yeah. And uh, so we will look forward to seeing you then, inshallah. Sure. So. I uh, believe here we have come to an end. So we thank everyone again, Dr. Paul and the team back in the US and the Learning Center of the National Museum and of course the US Embassy here in Muscat. Uh, also a huge appreciation to everyone who, it was, I mean, scheduled to be last Wednesday, but as we mentioned earlier in this webinar, some problem, I mean, technical problem, difficulties last week, but Alhamdulillah, we have done this session. So looking forward to see you next, I mean, in the next session here. So to all of you, thank you so much and good night and keep following the National Museum platform everywhere. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye.